Thank you, Francisco, uh, and welcome to you all. It's great to be here. I know this, this session is about prosperity, and I promise uh, we'll get there, but uh, the beginning is going to be a little dark. Um, we don't call it the dismal science uh, uh, for nothing. Um, so we live today in a divided nation. Uh, if you turn on the TV or go on the internet, you see that we disagree about, about culture, about politics, race, religion. Uh, you may support our president, you may oppose our president, your opinion is likely pretty firm. Uh, we're, we're a country that doesn't have a lot of middle ground. So part of where these differences have come from have been 30 years of increasing economic polarization and opportunity uh, in America. If today you live in a city like Boston, Chicago, Washington, D.C., or here in San Diego, good jobs at high wages abound. Uh, but those kind of jobs are scarce in a lot of other places in the old industrial centers of the Ohio River Valley, in inland cities like Fresno, California, uh, where I grew up, and in rural towns uh, across, uh, across America. That polarization means that the great ladder of social mobility in America, something that we pride ourselves in, in having and maintaining, that ladder has lost more than a few rungs. And let me just give you a couple data points to, to drive that, that point home. Americans born in the 1940s, had more than a 90% chance of earning more than their parents by the time they were adults. If we jump ahead just 30 years in time, Americans born in the 1970s have only 50-50 odds of besting their parents uh, in terms uh, of income. So understanding, diagnosing these regional disparities has been a major part of economic research over the last 25 years, and it's something to which I've devoted a substantial part uh, of my career. Uh, what I study is how globalization and technological change uh, have transformed the U.S. labor market. Now, freer trade globally, to be sure, has brought economic opportunity to where uh, it was most needed. Uh, uh, economic reforms and market opening in China and India have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of abject poverty. And this is one of the great accomplishments of human society over the last hundred years. In the U.S., China's rise in particular has cut two ways. So first imagine you're an engineer working at Apple in Cupertino, California. Uh, first, congratulations, you have one of the most sought after jobs uh, in America. Um, so what, Apple, uh, what, what China has meant for you is a supply of labor to assemble the iPhones that embody the technology you work so hard to create. As China became the world's factory, Apple's stock price soared, as did wages and housing values uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, so globalization meant dramatically increasing prosperity in tech centers around the world. Now, imagine instead you're a cabinet maker in Tennessee. Uh, it's pretty likely that China's rise cost you your job. Manufacturers of clothing, of footwear, of furniture, of other labor-intensive items simply haven't been able to compete with low-cost imports. And so the consequence has been these factories have shut their doors uh, and a way of life came to an end in America's industrial heartland. Technological change has also had momentous impacts. In particular, it's ex improved our quality of life in myriad ways. Uh, we now are connected in, in ways in which we could have never imagined. We have access to a vast variety of goods and services at lower prices uh, and at almost immediate delivery. Um, and we have prospects, real prospects, for curing diseases that have long plagued us. Like globalization, though, uh, technological change also cuts two ways. Automation has displaced workers with robots on auto assembly lines uh, in Detroit. It's reduced the need for bank tellers and for checkout clerks in cities around the country. And it's contributed to the increase in gulf in pay between CEOs uh, and their staff. Now, complicating all of this, is that Americans have become less mobile geographically. We think of ourselves as a country on the move, and indeed we have been for much of our history. But that has changed pretty dramatically in the past couple of decades. So if you, the cabinet maker, or you, the auto assembly worker, had moved to San Jose to work in tech, the loss of your factory job wouldn't have been so painful. But much more likely than not, you stayed put as did your fellow former factory workers in cities across the Midwest and Southeast. And so what that meant was that you watched from your front porch as, as stores closed, as families faced stress and broke apart, and in the last decade as the opioid crisis ran, uh, ran rampant. Now, 
Also working, so what's been working against the economic mobility are a couple of things. One is just the complications of modern family life in America. Families today have multiple income earners. They often rely on parents and family members for childcare, and they often live in more than one household. Uh, it's increasingly common for children to live with one parent with the other parent residing elsewhere. What that means is if you want to get it together, you lose your job and you want to move to a new city, you've got uh, an organizational problem, a challenge that is just much greater than in the past. Also working against mobility are the unintended, uh, unintended consequences of government policy, some of which uh, uh, um, Alex mentioned in, um, uh, in his presentation uh, a bit ago, and I'll talk more about uh, in a second. So a lot, of a lot of times it seems like what economists do is just sort of uh, catalog the challenges and the problems of modern life without telling us what we should do. Um, and indeed, that is a, a lot of what we spent uh, our time doing. But what we're doing at GPS now, uh, in concert with our partners at other universities, um, is uh, not just the fundamental research so that we understand deeply how these processes work, but we're also beginning to design practical solutions so that we can begin to make our communities more resilient and that we can begin to diminish what divides us. So I want to mention just uh, kind of three lessons that we've learned uh, along the way. Now, the first might sound kind of obvious or, or even trite, and, and that is it, but it's really important. Keeping people in work matters. It matters for human dignity, it matters for the dignity of families, and it matters for the dignity of, of communities. Uh, all too often, some of the policies we have in place work against maintaining tr uh, strong work incentives. Now, one of the best policies we have to promote the incentive to work is one that Alex mentioned, the earned income tax credit. But it has a big flaw. It targets its, uh, its benefits towards people who have dependents in the household. Suppose a family, because of, of, of hard times, has the mom living with the kids in one house and the dad living with the kid in another house. Um, if, the dad, if the mom's not working and the dad is, the dad only uh, 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 qualifies for about $400 in benefits. If they live together, as Alex mentioned, they can, they can get as much as $6,000 out of the system. So fixing this, uh, fixing this system would, would create a, a program that would provide strong incentives to work for low-income workers. And surprising as it might seem, it's something that Republicans and Democrats in Congress actually agree on. Uh, the value of this program and how it would be worthwhile to expand it. I know this because I've, I've talked to people on both sides of the aisle about this. Um, second, uh, we've learned that many government programs, well-intended as they might be, often fail to take local context uh, into account. Uh, worker training in particular, we spend lots of money on worker training, but we don't always verify that the skills being imparted are actually valued by local employers. So an example about how we might uh, do things differently comes from Dade County, Florida. Their community colleges are working with local employers to design degree programs that will match grads with the needs uh, of, of local business. Uh, third, uh, what we've learned is that business itself is an essential part of the social fabric of communities. Now this highlights uh, both the societal uh, importance of business and the societal obligations of business. An example of a place uh, where those obligations are taken seriously is Columbus, Indiana, where machinery manufacturers uh, work to provide community centers, after-school programs, and better technical training uh, in high schools. So as we, we assimilate these lessons, so what we see is that if we, as communities, as government, as business, uh, as universities, as families, embrace our shared responsibilities, then we have a chance uh, to begin to renovate communities that have been hit uh, by hard times. So in closing, I want to draw uh, on um, wisdom of a philosopher who's been very important in my life, and that is Bruce Springsteen. Um, <laughs> you have to indulge me. I'm a kid of the 1970s, and I have this outsized view of the importance of rock and roll in human civilization. Um, so what Springsteen, the boss, talks about uh, in his towns, some of it, uh, in his songs, some of it is pretty bleak. Uh, it's about the hardship of life in old industrial towns in America. And in his, his, perhaps his greatest song, Born to Run, he tells us, you got to get out while you're young. But Springsteen, as he, as he ages, also implores us to cherish our hometowns, to not surrender, and to embrace, yes, what it means to be born in the USA, whether we were born here or we came here to realize our dreams. So the boss, I think, has it right.
Thank you very much.